Okay, I think we can get started. So it's it's a great pleasure to have Josh Vajaj with us today. So he works as professor at VCU. Um, he spent some time in New York, uh, internal medicine in Brooklyn, uh, Jay Fellowship in Wisconsin, and uh, he's been working for a while in VCU. So he's done a lot of work in hepatic encephalopathy, focused mostly on uh, how the microbiome can impact and how can, we can modulate microbiome to improve outcomes in patients with hepatic encephalopathy, which is very interesting. It's kind of an orphan complication the last 15 years and still lactose on the vaccine and the standard of care. So there's a lot of room for improvement there. I know from a conference that we both were uh, somewhere in the US, I don't know what exactly where. <laughs> and I was impressed with the amount of work that he's done. He's extremely productive. Uh, he's doing pure translational research, meaning doing clinical trials based on the findings of what, which is very important and very precious in the, uh, say, scarcity of physics and scientists. So thank you very much for being here. Looking forward to the talk. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Augusto. Uh, um, so what I'm talk talking about right now is something that, you know, actually people have written chapters and books on. So this is something to cover in this short time. It's, it's going to be relatively superficial. So the, the questions that we have to ask, and being a physician scientist, I want to make sure that this is clinically grounded, but yet important enough for all of us, a translational scientist also to understand. So why is it relevant for us to study microbial change in liver disease? And what is lacking in the current therapies for liver disease? What are the levels of therapy that we can use that can focus on the microbiome? And I'm taking the whole patient at whatever stage of liver disease to see what we can make better. And is microbial therapy going to be enough? And the last question is the key question. You want to make sure that you also, and spoiler alert, it's not. You also want to make sure that you can take, take care of the underlying liver disease because that is the prime driver of the microbiome and vice, not really vice versa. So, before we go any further, let's give a primer on what the microbial analysis is and what the outputs are. Because right now, almost every single journal and every single disease that you can think of is being blamed on the microbiome. And before we actually figure out what it is, we need to know what levels of microbial research they've done and how to actually uh, make an informed decision on what those outputs are. So this is the kingdom of life, phylogenetic tree of life. These are bacteria. These are archaea, as the name suggests, these are very old. These are organisms that are methanogens that are uh, basically were initially considered to be part of bacteria, but now are a separate uh, kingdom. And this, this is eukaryotes. These are the bacteria, the Firmicutes, actinobacteria, proteobacteria, and verucomicrobiosis. These are the main gut microbiota, king of phylum, the highest level or the crudest way of describing bacteria. Okay? And this is where fungi are which is also a big component of our gut microbiome. And this is where all the animals are. So you can see the amount of diversity. The farthest away these clades are from each other, the more diverse they are compared to each other. So within a microbiota, within a phylum, there might be bacteria that are technically belonging to the same phylum that have genetic differences to the amount of between us and an elephant. They are still considered in that same phylum. And this is where all animals belong, which means our diversity is a fraction of the diversity we contain within ourselves. So that is very important for us to realize. And this is how a microbiologist will include, uh, will introduce Escherichia coli, coli to you. So it's phylum proteobacteria, class gamma proteobacteria, order enterobacteriales, family enterobacteriaceae, genus, species, and multiple strains underneath. So when you pick up a study, some of them do it at phylum level, some of them do it at family level, some of them do it at species level. So you want to make sure you're not comparing apples to oranges. And it's important for us to realize the family level is the most accessible one. You can actually, that's a lot of the studies end there because that's where the limit of the 16S sequencing goes from family and genus. When you do metagenomics, where all the genomes are sequenced, then you can go to species and strain level. But in the end, you have to realize that this is a huge amount of diversity that we carry within ourselves and depends minimally from person to person. And you can change very, very dramatically with things such as diet and even moving from one place to the other. 
And let's not forget the other group, which is the phages and the virome in the gut. I'm not going to go over the details, but it's not just the bacteria. You have fungi, you have parasites, and you have also the phages, uh, which are the major uh, viral uh, component of the gut. This is all what we have, but what we are going to talk about mostly today is the bacteria. And what are the products of bacterial metabolism that we should be worried about? Short chain fatty acids, complex carbohydrates. Phenolic acids can be from phytochemicals, including coffee that some of, some of you just drank or are drinking. Ammonia, of course, we my whole life is like one urinal cake after another, it's ammonia. Uh, and then fat with bile acids, very important. And then, of course, not bacteria can do bad stuff also. They can convert xenobiotic into carcinogens, or they can actually modulate how well you respond to therapy. And of course, acid, acid and dehydrogen alcohol is very well known. So what we want to know is what bacteria are present. That's the easiest way. But the hardest thing and the more important thing is what those bacteria are doing. So how do you find that out is to find out these specific compounds that the only bacteria can make. And that we'll talk about that a little bit later. So diversity is the very easiest way. The individual types and abundance. Okay, so you have... You have X number of bacteria, how many of them are different types from each other? The traditional teaching is the more diverse your microbiome is, the more resistant it is going to be, so therefore it is better. So that's the way things are. You have to think about the diversity in a rainforest versus a desert. And a rainforest becoming a desert just requires like one or two cycles of the ecosystem changing. You have to think of your microbiome as an ecosystem. So the more diverse it is, quote unquote, the better off it's going to be. And this is another concept of relative abundance. Very few studies are able to tell you exactly how many bacteria there are. Because we don't know what the, it's not like a petri dish culture. It's like stool. When you talk, I'm sorry to talk about stool when you're eating, but you're all gastroenterologists, but there you go. When you talk about stool, it's impossible to quantify what the actual content of mass of the stool is. Some of it is water, some of it is what you just ate, some of it is xenobiotics. But you don't know what the actual basis is of the total. So then you can count the total number of bacteria, but it's very hard to actually put a mass to it. So what ends up happening is you calculate the relative abundance. So if you have 100 bacteria, if 10 of them are uh, enterobacteriaceae, you say 10%. Okay. But again, if you gave someone antibiotics and they become total 10 bacteria, and now to which one of them is enterobacteriaceae, this cannot differentiate. It will still say that the enterobacteriaceae is 10%. So that's something that you have to keep in mind when we talk about this. Most of these studies talk about relative abundance and not absolute abundance, which is another reason why the function of the microbiota is very important. So this is how things are. Easiest, what is present? You can still do culture like we do in our clinical practice. And some very high, uh, very high throughput people can actually do culturomics also, which is like extensive, extensive, extremely expensive way of actually figuring out each and every bacteria. And the culture independent techniques, which is what we're going to talk about, is 16S, which is the ribosomal RNA only found in prokaryotes. Because fungi are eukaryotes, you can't use that. Fungi have 18S, so you want to make sure that you actually differentiate. So when you do a 16S, all you get is bacteria and maybe some RNA. And this is important thing. What are the microbes doing? You can do metatranscriptomics, metaproteomics, and metabolomics. Metabolomics is what I like the most because you can do it untargeted. You can throw a big fishing net. Don't tell the NIH you're doing that, but you can actually go do a big fishing net and come out with whatever it is. The problem with this, it, it often very irritatingly comes back with things such as glucose. Now, what are you going to do with glucose? It can be produced by us. It can be produced by what we're eating. It can be produced by microbiota. So you, you, it doesn't help you one way or the other. But if it comes out with something such as bile acids, especially things like secondary bile acids, that only microbiota can make. Then you have a story. And then that, that then, then it's not targeted. And then that's not untargeted. Then it's targeted. So metabolomics can be targeted or untargeted as well. So when you know what you're looking for, obviously that's targeted. But ultimately, as a physician scientist or as a, someone who wants to talk about, you have to bring it back to what is happening to either your cell culture system, your host, your in vivo animal, or your human being. Otherwise, to make this, to complete this whole story and make it interesting beyond your laboratory as well. So, the relevance of microbiota in liver disease is profound. It is there when you talk about pre serotic conditions and it's when you talk about serotic conditions as well. So, it has been studied, <coughs> NAFLD, alcohol, 
you talk about uh, hepatitis C, you talk about hepatitis B, you talk about primary biliary cirrhosis, uh, uh, primary biliary cirrhosis, uh, cholangitis, sorry, <laughs> primary sclerosing cholangitis, sorry, old habits. Uh, it has been studied in all of them. But the two main important things are alcohol and methyl because these are situations in which the microbiota and the gut liver axis is engaged way before the liver disease actually happens. And we know of phenotypes of people who drink their life away and then never get liver disease. Nothing is more frustrating than that. And you have other people who are dying at the age of 31 from alcoholic hepatitis. And you, you're struggling, you're doing all these things like uh, Dr. Im has done about transplanting them. And this was a very easy question to ask. Does the microbiota at baseline define who ultimately gets liver disease and who doesn't? Sadly, the answer was it does not. The microbiota of patients, these are healthy controls, these are patients with alcoholic liver disease, alcohol without liver disease, and these are the patients with alcoholic liver disease, and this is the bacteroid AC, this is one of those things. Long story short, it did not define who ultimately was going to get liver disease or not. So we are much more complex than just our microbiota, but microbiota may be helping propagate, to propagate this stuff, because as things go get worse, the microbiota does get worse. Here, you see that? But there is no way of defining. There's a big overlap. Same with NAPO. The problem with human studies is that all these inserts take decades or years to actually form. So when you have a patient who have all these things together, it's very difficult to peel apart what happened, what came first, chicken or the egg. And right now, all you can say is this is uh, F0 to F2. And don't, I'm not, don't worry about the details, but look at the red bars they get worse as the disease progresses. So there is at least a face validity that the gut microbiota get worse even before cirrhosis, especially in these two conditions and another conditions like PSC where the, the fibrosis, cirrhosis has not yet happened. And as the fibrosis gets worse, this thing also gets worse, but we do not have an idea, at least from human studies, we can't, whether this is the chicken or the egg, whether this is the response or this is an actual causative. So again, as I said, that these are all ecosystems. And how do you define ecosystems? You have to think like an ecologist. And when you think like an ecologist, you have to come up with species that are good and species that are bad. This is an oversimplification, but we have to sometimes simplify concepts to actually make difficult things translate into practice. So when you talk about an ecosystem, what you're looking for are keystone organisms and indicator organisms. These are biosensors. So presence and absence of microbiota can be biosensors that could be very important to tell you something beyond what the clinical uh, things are doing. So you look at this is a keystone of the art. If this keystone falls down, everything collapses, right? So look at the marine ecosystem. This is a krill. It's a small krill, okay? But everything else is dependent on this krill. So if this krill collapses, the whole marine ecosystem will collapse. So you want more of the krill. If you count krill, everything else will take care of itself because you look at the food chain, everything starts here and ends up with the whale. Okay? You don't have to count the whales if the krill is okay. But if the krill is gone, the whales cannot survive because none of these intermediate things can survive. So you want adequate presence of this. And the reverse is true for indicator organisms. If these organisms are present, something really bad is going on. For example, if you look at the contamination of the sewage in the drinking water, they look there's a you look at the coliforms, the amount of E. coli, or if it hits a beyond number, that's a really bad thing. So the adequate biosensor is a combination of the good bacteria and the bad bacteria. So we devised one for cirrhosis, which is called the cirrhosis dysbiosis ratio, and we wanted to see can microbiota be biosensors. And before that, let's go further about what specific things are abnormal in patients with cirrhosis. You know, we often think of cirrhosis as just a liver disease, right? It's a liver disease. We see complications, but most people outside the hepatology field don't appreciate its systemic consequences. You know, it affects almost every organ of the body. And those organs are affected, and especially the microbiota affected, because it's primarily an immunosuppressive disease. And because of this immunomodulation that cirrhosis brings, it allows the microbiota to grow everywhere. Okay. So you have stool microbiota in patients with cirrhosis is different from healthy controls. Sigma, uh, the colonic mucosa is different. The ascites is different, the small bowel is different, and the liver microbiota is different. We used to think for a very long time that liver was sterile. It's not. When people die, there are actually bacterial DNA. The liver is able to fight it. And when you talk about people 
who died with alcoholic liver disease versus people who died of alcoholism without liver disease versus people who died of something else. The amount of bacterial DNA in the liver is way, way higher in people who died with alcoholic cirrhosis than the ones who died of alcoholic liver, alcoholism for something else mm -hmm. without liver disease. So the liver is able to handle a huge amount of bacterial DNA, but in people who do not have liver disease, that doesn't spill over and it does not cause an immunogenesic uh, genesity. So the gut liver axis, as we expected, is abnormal microbially in patients with cirrhosis, which makes sense. You know, the bile acids are not being produced. They're a bigger, big modulator of how microbiota exist, how they actually behave with each other. But we also found changes in the saliva, in the serum, as well as the skin. Now, how can that be explained by a liver disease? It's because it's not just a liver disease. It is an immunological disorder that has far-ranging consequences. So therefore, microbiota, including enterobacteriaceae, the bugs that are, should not be there, are higher in the skin, higher in the serum, as well as higher in the uh, saliva of these patients. And this has prognostic significance also. So it's important to realize that these microbiota are, in, are allowed to grow because the immunological <laughs> system is uh, uh, allowed. So this is the cirrhosis dysbiosis ratio that I was telling you about. So the good bacteria such as Lactospirase, Ruminococcus, Clostridium cluster 14. These are bugs that produce short chain fatty acids. These are bugs that actually make primary to secondary bile acids. And in any kind of study that you think of, in which the healthy controls are compared to a disease state, these bugs are always present in healthy controls. So these are a marker. Remember I said, this is a keystone organism. These are good th things that you want. And in the bottom are enterobacteriaceae, which are, we, we don't like enterobacteriaceae, basically. I'll come out and say it. It's this gram-negative rods. These are, you know, proteobacter. These are, these are not stuff you want hanging around. Okay. But I also put bacteroidaceae because, you know, some people have zero, so I didn't want this ratio to collapse. Poor bacteroidaceae has nothing to do. It's not a bad bacteria. It's just a filler. Is there okay? So if you have the good ones on top and the bad ones at the bottom, a high ratio means everything's okay, right? And that's what happens. Healthy controls, highest, compensated out patients with cirrhosis low, decompensated out patients lower, and infected in patients, most of whom had spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, had the lowest, which means they had the worst ratio. And then we went ahead. Is it stable over time? If people over six months, nothing is happening to them, cirrhosis is stable. Is this stable? Yes. Does it get worse when people get uh, worse? Did, after encephalopathy, it did get worse. It, does it get worse out in people who are subsequently hospitalized? Can, can you predict hospitalization? Yes. Does it get better after transplant? Yes. So it actually tells you that the microbia, microbiota can be a way of actually figuring out how things go with the patient. But these are very expensive things to do. These are also things that are very icky because it involves handling stool. Okay. So let, does it add anything? Does it add anything to what we are already doing? We have the MEL score. We have all these other things that we do to predict things. And the answer is yes, especially in diseases such as hepatic encephalopathy, which is really the best model of the gut-brain axis that you can ever find. Okay, Things such as depression, autism, anxiety, all of these things are mooted to be things related to the gut-brain axis. But they take years to months to decades to actually uh, figure out. And then once you're fixing one of the problems. Hepatic encephalopathy, you make people have gigantic bowel movements and they wake up. You cannot get a more dramatic demonstration of the gut-brain axis than this. You have a comatose patient and they wake up. So what we did, we wanted to find out what specific bugs were associated with. So we did the stool initially and of course the stool is very different from the colonic mucosa. So ruminococcus, you remember the good bacteria, fecalibacterium. For those who work in IBD, you know fecalibacterium prosnitzii is one of the markers of good intestinal barrier. This is a stuff that is present in every single person who does not have IBD. And if you have IBD, it disappears. And this is a marker of something good. So this was correlated with cognitive function. So presence of this in the colonic mucosa was correlated with cognitive function. And what's more important, we did two aspects of the brain MRI. One aspect is the astrocyte, where it takes up the ammonia, swells out, swells up, and makes glutamine inside. So because it doesn't, it, uh, it uh, throws out myonositol and choline. This is the same thing that happens in patients with acute liver failure, but happens over hours. That's why people with acute liver failure get brain edema, whereas people with cirrhosis and hepatic encephalopathy, because most of them are older, so they have a lot of space to expand, uh, and it takes over months to years to happen. So this, 
So that's ammonia related. And then there's an inflammation related part, which happens in the white matter tract. And there's another way of the MRI to actually figure it out called diffusion tensor imaging. What we found is different groups of bugs were associated with different things. So we are talking about the enterobacteriaceae was associated with ammonia. Lachnospiracy was positively associated with good stuff with the ammonia. Whereas there's another group of bugs called porphyromonadaceae, which are typically found in the mouth, teeth. Porphyromonas gingivalis, number one cause of periodontitis in the world, associated with NAFL. And we're going to talk about later how you can actually fix the teeth to improve brain function in patients with cirrhosis. So these patients are screwed both ways. There are two groups of bugs that are higher in their stool. One of them attacks the astrocyte, the other one attacks the neurons. Ultimately, they end up in people feeling crummy. Can you actually do a stool sample or a saliva sample and find out if someone has significant cognitive dysfunction? There's an entire group of subclinical hepatic encephalopathy or minimal hepatic encephalopathy that happens in these patients, which is impossible to diagnose because no one even wants to spend more than five minutes with our patient. We're too busy typing. Anything that takes us away from typing and billing are $35 from Medicare. It's a big deal. <laughs> so even a five minute encephalopathy, people are groaning. They want it less. Five minutes, I reduced a 45 minute task to five minutes. No, it's too much. I can't do it. Okay, send their poop to us. We will tell you. If, <laughs> if their poop or saliva had these two organisms, there's 99% chance that they do not have minimal or overt hepatic encephalopathy. So this is a way you can actually translate this huge amount of literature into something that can potentially be used in clinic. What about hospitalizations in our patients? Using the salivary or a stool microbiota, you can predict independent of our clinical predictors, PPI use, MEL score, everything else, who is going to be hospitalized. And now I've got your attention because CMS will actually come up and hit you where it hurts, the money. Yes, the microbiota, and we have a poster at ASLD, how microbiota analysis, even in its crudest and most expensive form, is still cost effective in actually making this prediction of rehospitalization, provided you can at, at, uh, figure it out in place way to reduce. So what about inpatients? In microbiota, when you talk, we talked about outpatients, how they can add, add us, uh, help out how people are doing. In inpatients, in this study from Taiwan, they took patients with acute episodes of hepatic encephalopathy, and during that episode, they were able to figure out who is going to come back and who's going to remain free of hepatic encephalopathy based on microbiota. In this study, which was a, a replication of our studies that was done before, we took microbiota at baseline to find out who died. And this is micro, people who died, microbiota, the stool was taken every day. And you can see, despite our best efforts, people who died had a different microbiota on admission. Anything in the red clustered together, that is closest. I'm going to wake up lactulose enema. Okay. Okay. So, so then you go. Uh, we get the, uh, the blue one survived. Okay. This was then the, in a multi-center study. Same thing. You look at this, good, these bacteria, people who died and were in hospice, enterococcus was higher, uh, whereas choreobacteriaceae, which is a good bacteria, was in people. <coughs> so this is very scary. People who come to the hospital, they give their microbiota within 12 hours before antibiotics are thrown at them, can independently predict who's going to live, die, develop ACLF, and come back with hepatic encephalopathy. So this tells you that we, once they're in the hospital, things are, it, it's too far away. The horse has left the barn. You want to actually focus on these high melt patients before they get into the hospital. Because it's not like we were just sitting there ignoring these patients. They came to the hospital, we did our level best to try and make them feel better, not die. And you know, that didn't happen to these patients. So the microbiota, I hope I've convinced you, can be a good biosensor that does add value added to is value added to our current clinical uh, uh, way of thinking. What about microbiome HCC? This is a center that is very well known for this, but more work is needed because the AUCs are between 0.79 and 0.85. <coughs> the 0.79 and 0.85 is good for some things that you don't have reasonable alternatives for. But HCC, we do have a lot of alternatives. When you put a lot of these things together, it's, it's annoying, Put you know, you're doing ultrasounds, AFPs, and then if ultrasound shows a little squiggle, you do MRIs, and then you keep on changing your own tail by multiple MRIs. But they are there, they are there, and they have guidance. So this has to be close to 0.99 for us to actually put that in a thing that we have alternatives for. But what it tells you that with every single thing, early, advanced, 
it gets worse. It's the same thing with HCC and with cohorts, different cohorts. And mind you, this is from China. It's a very large study because Chinese people also have hepatitis B without uh, cirrhosis who can also get HCC. So it's a big, huge, huge uh, public health issue in a country that may not have all the resources to deal with that. So therefore, it is very important for them to get a little more non-invasive markers. But this is where we need to do a lot more research as far as human, uh, human studies in the Western countries. There's been some studies from Italy done, uh, that have been done, but nowhere close to the amount of depth and breadth that this wonderful study has done in the past. But this is microbiota and HCC in modulation not only of diagnosis, but as well as how specific immunotherapies, how people react to immunotherapies, can be very difficult, different uh, when you figure out the microbiome. Yeah, so the bacteria that are more closely associated with uh, cirrhosis, the same ones that are associated with HCC? Yes, unfortunately. More of the same. More of the same. It's just a little more of, um, it's more of a continuum. So there's no like sharp cutoff that we have HCC that. My feeling is that the HCC, especially the small HCC, does not exert that kind of mic microbial influence that an advanced HCC would. <coughs> So advanced HCC, again, you don't know, need all of this you can do an ultrasound. Here. So Jess, those controls are subotics or something? No, they're healthy controls. So that's the thing. I was one of the reviewers of this. I was not very happy, but it was huge. It was huge. So I, like, I couldn't possibly do the thousands of patients to be adequately powered. But and a lot of these patients did not have cirrhosis. That's mm -hmm. another thing. Yes. So in your slides, we talked about you know those who have this microbiota versus those dying versus <coughs> Maybe you're going to get to it, but are there any interventions that restore? Okay, that because that otherwise yeah. it's yeah. kind of a yeah. 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 no, there are. Interventions. So hepatic encephalopathy. I'm, I'm just going to briefly talk about. And again, like we, yeah, go ahead. You have a question. Earlier, you mentioned the need to have the combination of multiple uh, sort of non-invasive measures of value and uh, similar line. When you go to a different microbiome, is that an independent predictor? Or yes, independent. We put a whole lot of things in there, especially when we put the ratio. It's difficult to put the entire microbiome in one. You can put parts of it, like you can put diversity. That's one module, one, one aspect of it you can put it in. Or you can put things such as this ratio that we created that can easily fit into any logistic regression formula. Otherwise, you're basically relying into things such as artificial neural networks or machine learning, which are very opaque. You know, which which is big. once you start using those words or AI, you basically have lost 95% of the people because it's basically you you it takes a lot of anything that requires this much explanation will never catch on. So you want to make sure that you have something like the merit score is the upper limit of what we can use because we are forced to use it. But if you can't calculate it in your hands, typically it's, it doesn't really flow that much. Okay, so that's your point. With the multivariable analysis, we were able to show. All so hepatic encephalopathy, of course, the liver is disease. The gut becomes inflamed and it makes all sorts of stuff. So if the shunting happens, it directly affects the brain. The liver has hyperaminemia because of the urea cycle uh, suppression, as well as the microbiota that reaches the liver. Remember, I was telling you the bacterial DNA. It makes the liver more inflamed. Then you have the kidneys and the muscles that we rarely talk about also become uh, ammonia producers and ultimately deliver the astrocyte uh, in the brain, microglia, and neuronal dysfunction. All of this happens. So hepatic encephalopathy takes a village to make in this patient. And as I said, there is a subclinical form and then there's a clinical form as well. So do you need microbiota to develop hepatic The answer is yes. In this study, we had conventional controls, conventional cirrhosis mice with uh, CCL4 garbage, germ-free controls and germ-free cirrhotic mice with identical protocol. Germ-free cirrhotic mice took four extra weeks to develop cirrhosis, which means the microbiota were uh, involved in the pathogenesis of this kind of thing. And I didn't do use IP injections. Some people use IP injections, which of course completely bypass the microbiota. So what we found is inflammation was much higher. Inflammation, uh, glial uh, activation, and microglial activation, which are all indirect markers of hepatic encephalopathy, were only high in the mice who had cirrhosis in the conventional condition, but not high in the mice who were germ-free cirrhosis. It tells you that at least in this CCL4 model, you need the microbiota to do this. So what? Did you look at intestinal hot pass based on that? Huh? Did you look at intestinal hot pass? No, but we did use we did glutaminase. The glutaminase was high. 
which is another source of ammonia. So I didn't tell you in these germ-free serotic mice there was high ammonia, but despite high ammonia, their microbiome, their brain did not get inflamed because there was no bug. And why was they high in ammonia? Because they were eating glutamine, and glutamine is broken down by the intestinal glutaminase into glutamate and ammonia. So the ammonia was high, but ammonia being high alone in the absence of gut microbiota does not lead to brain inflammation. So, <clears throat> the new model, uh, because the ammonia CCL4 has their own effect on the microbiota? It could. It really could. But we were waiting till they get cirrhosis in the end. So CCL4, if you look at the studies with CCL4, which were done with IP in germ-free mice, they developed cirrhosis earlier. In R, in germ-free mice, because we were doing gavage, they developed cirrhosis later. So it, this is the way how you look at it. When you doing it by gavage, the microbiota are required to do it earlier. So it does have some effect on the microbiota. But their balance could be changed, right? I'm sorry? But their balance could be changed. Yes, definitely. They could be changed. Yeah. But we were comp the whole point here was not to com was to compare germ-free cirrhosis versus regular cirrhosis, whichever way you look at it. We we avoid the bile duct ligation model, which is another model for because that immediately changes the microbiome. We divert the entire bile flow. And then that is an even bigger slap on the face of the microbiome that you can't really, you know, uh, uh, figure out later. So what are the current therapies that are microbially dependent? Probiotics in pre cirrhosis horrendous. Horrendous, horrendous, horrendous. There is no other way to describe it. It's there is two weeks, four weeks, six months maximum. And the endpoints, the readouts are something as silly as like ASC or ALT, which really do not, we know, do not make any difference when we compare to NASH and NAFL, etc. So the property power studies are now being done, which really should be long-term, multiple center, placebo controlled, etc., but not in probiotics. In hepatic encephalopathy, there's good evidence that the antibiotics, probiotics, but again, they do not pre prevent all HE episodes. So we need better therapies, even in hepatic encephalopathy. So what are the levels of therapy, we need to answer your question, that the microbiota knowledge can actually help us. Controlling etiology, not really microbial. If someone is drinking, they really have to stop drinking. The microbiota is not going to fix their amount of drinking. Same with NASH, they have to control whatever the NASH is. You can't do a fecal transplant and the person becomes thin. You can't do that. It's not possible. So the etiology needs to be treated first. If they have hep C, they have to be treated. If they have hepatitis B, it needs to be suppressed. All of these things are important, but it's highly unlikely that just a microbial-based agnostic therapy of etiology can fix it. What about effect milieu, inflammatory milieu locally? Locally in the gut, we can do it with the oral cavity as we talked about. Change gut microbiota composition and hopefully function. You can do fecal microbial transplant, PPI, uh, fix the PPI, engineer bacteria and do dietary modification. And you can change microbial interaction with other mi microbiota such as fungi. Okay. Let's do systemic and inflammatory control. So this is the oral microbiota. This is the human microbiome project. Any, these are principal component analysis. Anything that clusters together is related. Anything that clusters far apart is not, not related to each other. So the GI tract is right here. The oral cavity is right here. So it's not simply swallowing whatever is in your mouth that populates your GI tract. There's many other reasons and many other microbiota types. People were different oral and different uh, GI tract. Same thing in patients with cirrhosis. This is the oral microbiota, and this is the salivary microbiota. <laughs> and as I talked to you before, the salivary microbiota was able to predict hospitalizations in these patients as well. So it is very different from each other, from uh, controls versus uh, um, uh, healthy controls versus cirrhosis. Now the question is, can you fix this by cleaning their teeth? So we had three groups of people. We had healthy controls. We had patients with cirrhosis, two groups of patients with cirrhosis who were kind of meld matched with each other. Some of them had encephalopathy, some of them didn't have encephalopathy, but the two cirrhosis groups were matched with the encephalopathy, yes and no. And then one group got periodontal cleaning. You basically we, uh, unleashed a dental hygienist on them who made them feel really bad about themselves. And actually they said, your teeth are horrible, etc. And then they cleaned. Okay. So we excluded people who were too good, which means there was nothing to be cleaned, which is highly unlikely. I knew. I laughed when I was putting the exclusion criteria. They always find something. It's like a mechanic. You go inside and they always find something to fix. <laughs> but we did exclude people who had severe periodontal. Or an abscess. We didn't want them because, they, not because they don't need to be treated, it's just that one cleaning is not reasonably going to affect 
their natural history. So we did. Yeah. Did, the, did you um, have different ideologies? Yes, species? we did have a different, ideology, but they were kind of. When we compared them, they were kind of similar. No one was actively drinking, and no one was actively smoking because those two things can also affect the periodontal uh, uh, health. And um, we needed 20 natural teeth. And we're in Virginia, we're not in Western Virginia, but it was very difficult. It was really difficult. And when people had perfect teeth, they had dentures. So it was needless to be excluded in dentures, people. So it was very difficult to enroll for the study. So ultimately, what we found. Is after cleaning, the pre post therapy and endotoxin went down, TNF went down. It's same in the controls, the TNF also went down, which is what we'd expect in these patients. Although the amount was much less anyway to start with. In patients who did not get this therapy over the same 30 days, the uh, endotoxin went up, is what you would expect as the disease process turned. Uh, the salivary microbiota got better, the stool microbiota got better, and more interestingly, in the patients with HE on lactose and rifaxin, their brain function got better and their quality of life got better. It did not get better in people who did not have encephalopathy to start with. Their biochemical in, in, in indices and microbiota get better, but they did not feel any change, mostly because they were not having much problems to start with, these patients with cirrhosis without HD. Uh, and no changes were seen in the group that did not undergo periodontal therapy. So this is one thing that is very easy to implement in your practice. We do this for patients who are undergoing liver transplant evaluation. And there's a reason for why we're doing this, because these are Huge foci of infection. And if someone has severe periodontitis, it is equivalent to having a wound at the size of your palm. Is that how inflamed your whole mouth is? <clears throat> and many studies have shown that this actually worsens liver disease. It worsens a whole lot of things. Oral health is a big barometer of what is happening. And this is very accessible. It's something that you can do. No one is going to blame you for having the patient go to a dentist. The patient might hate you for it, but you may actually do something that is best for them. We are doing this in our veterans, the VA like the NHS in the UK, does not include dental services. That's a big problem. But our university has a, a fellows clinic. <laughs> Basically, they go in and they do whatever they want. So, so that's free for the patients. So we send them to them. I mean, they, can, they know how to clean the teeth, hopefully, by the, by the time. So we do advise this regularly to our patients. And the VA is covered for transplant evaluation, but not everyone is a transplant evaluation. And there's only so much you can lie on that. So this, yeah, you, you uh, just some dimension for people that have dentures. How does that affect their microbiome? They're much better off there. And that the dentures are not. Is that because of underlying periodontal? The whole point is the the, uh, the the interface between the tooth and the gum is where all the action happens. And in between there, there's a group of bacteria that are the explorers that stick there. Then one another group of bacteria that goes on top. And it's ultimately defined, they make a resistant biofilm that is almost impossible to break, even by our best of the, so you need those kind of scraping in there. So the indentulous people are much better off if their dentures fit okay. But you should not expect your teeth just to go to <laughs> Okay, so this is the oral gut hepatic axis. I think we are running a little late on time, uh, so I'm just going to go further. But basically all of this is related, but it's not as simple as just swallowing stuff. You don't swallow stuff and it populates stuff. It is something that has to do with other things as well. So what about microbial composition and functional change? Yes. Another thing that you can do in your practice right now, anyone, fellow, anyone, just look at it. Look at it. Most of your patients are on TPI for completely unknown reasons. Okay? Even if you don't believe that they are actually of any use to their patient, blah, blah, if you don't believe that they are harming your patient, if they don't need it, it's an extra expense. And you see the number of Tablet these poor patients with cirrhosis have to take. You remove one, they'll have, they'll be happy. They'll be happy. Okay, and that's how you figure out. So if you have PPIs, the alcoholic liver injury in the mouse model is increased via enterococcus. So PPIs increase enterococcus in an alcoholic liver injury model of a mouse. And it, as you know, alcohol does not cause cirrhosis in a mouse model. People have tried these people much better than me have tried, and the mice get drunk, but they do not get cirrhosis. So this is not a perfect model, but alcoholic liver injury in the mouse increases with PPI, only enterococcus. So what happens when you take compensated patients with cirrhosis? Remember the principal component analysis? Things that are closer are together, are related. Things that are far apart are not related. We gave 40 milligrams of omeprazole to compensated patients with cirrhosis and control. And what we found, this is pre, yellow, see how they're tightly clustered together. And post, it's like a big dynamite bomb went off and they went scattered together. And what it was, 
is 900% increase in Streptococcus salivarius. Suddenly your gut is now able to receive Streptococcus that it was able to be killed by the, uh, the, the gastric acid before with one dose of omeprazole for 14 days. And Streptococcus is not an innocuous thing. It produces ammonia, it has urease, it also is associated, is the number three cause of SDP, right? It's not something that you should just take lying down. This is something that is very important. What about, you remember, most compensated patients don't get SDP. So what about decompensated patients? So we took people who were off PPI in decompensated state, it was a nightmare to recruit as well because we had to exclude, we had to get people with ascites but who did not have encephalopathy. You can see how difficult it is to get that group. So you, we, if they were off PPI, we started them on PPI and if they were on PPI for weird reasons, reasons that no one knew what it was, we took them off and this is again 40 days. Okay? And what we found is for pyromonidase, you remember the one that was associated with brain inflammation, went up in people who started on PPI, streptococcus again went up whereas they all went down. So even in decompensated patients with cirrhosis, if you withdraw the PPI, that is for an unnecessary reason, you can actually bring their microbiome to a much better state. So these are two things that you can do without, with zero cost to yourself in this patient population. It does not involve adding anything. It actually involves removing stuff to the patient that can actually potentially help them. Okay, what about fetal microbial transplant? Please do not do this to your mm -hmm. patients. Where it is highly, highly, highly investigated. So, because we have a much more general advanced population than C. Diff, our patients get diseases that are based on the gut, SVP. If you put an S fecal transplant in someone with delivery and tomorrow they get an SVP, you cannot by any way figure out whether it came from that patient um, or whether it was from the FMT. So, you have to do it in a highly controlled circumstances. Avoiding antibiotics post FMT may not be feasible because some of these people are on rifaximin and on SVP prophylaxis, which guidelines tell you improve their practice, improve their outcomes. So it is unethical just because someone is getting a fecal transplant to withdraw those medicines so that your fecal transplant, which is an experimental treatment, may get better. So it's not something to be taken very lightly. Uh, and the first major study, by actually it's case series, was done in uh, Canada. They took, they did one fecal transplant via colonoscopy and the rest via uh, animals. And what they found is the patient got better. It felt better and then they got some other infection. So this is before fecal transplant. The patient is right here. You see the red dot? That was a stool before. So this is the donor. The donor pooped three times. Three times the microbiota was different. And I don't know why the FDA wants to regulate this as a drug. You cannot ensure that the poop has the same thing every time. You eat pizza today, your poop will be different. You eat something else tomorrow, Chicago deep dish pizza, it will be different <laughs> tomorrow. So it will be very, very difficult. Different to standardize. But they did it. So ultimately, the patient was in the between. You can see that before fecal transplant, this is the donor, somewhere in between. So we wanted to go one step further. Right now, our equipoise in patients with liver diseases, patients who are already on lactose and refaximin and still are feeling crummy. Those are the patients we have nothing more to offer. So if they get a fecal transplant and something bad happens to them, we can in all good conscience say, we tried, and this is a patient population that we had nothing more to offer. Compare it to a patient population who has not developed encephalopathy yet or a patient population who is only on lactose, there is an FDA approved therapy therapy, rifaximin. That's the therapy you should be giving them, rather than subjecting them to a fecal transplant. So that's why I chose the worst of the worst population, because this is what where the clinical need is. So we took healthy patients and HE patients, we sent them to our collaborators in Open Bio and MIT to come up with what is missing in our patients with HE, but what is to have healthy control. And what they found was exactly replication of what we had published a million times over, which is lactose, pyrese, and ruminococcus. Remember the good ones that are on the numerator that were missing. So we said, okay, no shit. And then they said, yes, fine. <laughs> Same thing. So we've got the stool donor who had the highest relative abundance. Again, relative abundance of these things. And we used the one stool sample from this one donor to give to everyone who end up getting the fecal transplant. So we divided the groups into people who got antibiotic plus fecal transplant versus people who got standard of care. And this, mind you, this was a phase one study. The FDA would not allow us to do a large study, and I didn't want to also, to make sure it was safe. We didn't want to have huge amounts of SDP suddenly coursing through these patients' uh, you know, bowels. So what we found is not only was it safe, 
It reduced hospitalizations, improved their brain function, reduced the HE episodes, and because we were giving them antibiotics beforehand, the diversity had completely collapsed. It came back once the fecal transplant was given. And not only was it good for five months, which was the initial follow-up, it was long-term. It was good more than five, uh, more than one year also. Same with the brain function. So this is very important to realize. Right now, the, the take-home study for the take-home part from this is it is safe. That's all you can conclude. Everything else, it was not powered to do. Long-term, at least it was safe, even long-term for these patients. So any changes microbial function. So in this animal study, they put in microbiota that does not is incapable of producing ammonia. And they found that the mice who had the microbiota that did not produce ammonia had a much better prognosis compared to mice who had regular microbiota. And we wanted to do the same thing in our patients with cirrhosis that we did from that study. And we wanted to find out if the, so the brain function got better, the cognition got better. You know, this is the composite score of the PHEs, high score is that. And this is the same thing with this encephalap or the screw. So the other, remember I talked to you about bile acids and the short chain fatty acids, which are functional things that only the microbiota can produce. So after the antibiotics, the short-chain fatty acids completely collapsed, as you'd expect. But after FMT, it got restored. The green is the FMT, the, the uh, orange is the uh, standard of care. Of note, the standard of care group did not get antibiotics. So it's a trial of FMT plus antibiotics versus standard of care. Would you rather have had antibiotics in the standard of care group? Kuda, yes. Yeah. No, no I, the, all, the problem would have... Uh, Part one is purely logistical. Uh, we would have had to do double our size of people who got FMT. So the, instead of giving them antibiotics, you know, loving them and leaving them with antibiotic resistant organisms, the op, this upside would have been FMT alone. So antibiotics plus FMT and FMT alone. And that is thing is being highly debated right now in the C. diff literature as well as the ulcerative colitis literature is to do a free course of antibiotics, basically just run a gigantic crawler and then populated microbiota. But in our case, we were kind of open biome kind of forced us to do it. I still did not fully that for it. So um, bile acids, it disappeared. Uh, the, the conjugating capacity disappeared. And the secondary bile acids disappeared after antibiotics. And it was restored after the fecal microbial transplant. So not only does the function get better, uh, sorry, the composition get better, the function also get better with this stuff. But we wanted to show the same thing with capsules, without So these were people who were on placebo versus capsules, the patients were blinded. And what we found is similar things. It was safe. Even though the HE episodes did not get better, their hospitalizations did get lower in this population. And in this one, we actually had micro, we had biopsies from the duodenum because it was a capsule that was opening in the proximal small bowel. And this is pre, uh, post, pre and this is post. And you can see, they're so different from each other. Stool had higher lactospirase and uh, because it's the same similar donor with higher pruminococcaceae <coughs> and lipopolysaccharide binding protein, which is endotoxin stable endotoxin, went down after transplant, a fecal transplant, but did not change after placebo. So right now we are doing a phase two study funded by the Veterans Administration, in which in 100 patients we are dividing them into people getting placebo from top, the active ones at the bottom and four combinations of that. And the actual, it's a phase two study, which will take six months. If you know the species that have this positive effect, can't they just be selectively cultured that the changes that way? Why? There are some companies that are doing that. Um, and they, the problem is that they actually, it's very difficult to do that because it, they work with each other. And this lactospirase has hundreds of organisms underneath. It's not one organism. So that's why the probiotic studies kind of fail in the long term because you need groups. And that's why the FMT works because it suddenly is a shock to the so system. So there may be other things in the stool that travel. Absolutely. With those two is just that those are the two that you can two, identify as a marker. At a, at the yes, as a marker. So if they are there, it means everything else might also be there. That support them in some way. Yes. So. Has, has there ever been looked at to actually spike the, the FMT with more of these bacteria to kind of hedge your bet? We kind of like we chose the one which was spiked yeah. already, pre spiked. Yeah. So, you know. But you get to help get rid of that, like, relative abundance issue. So, like, so growing caps put in the cap. Was that, was that in? I mean, there's a company called Rebiotics that is doing that right now. And they actually are spinning down the quote unquote sport farming good stuff. 
and then they only produce putting back in patients. We'll see how that works in patients, with, but certainly it's not been done in hepatic encephalopathy yet. They're doing a trial in Canada. Hopefully, they'll get some good results. How do you select the protein? You know, I'm sorry? That's why I'm trying to try with the protein. These are great questions, and it's great that you're stimulating us to think. But yeah, good. good. The so now putting it back in mice. So people were not happy with me with this FMT plus antibiotics. And I could not get them to accept that the antibiotics are never a good idea in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. I was forced to put the antibiotic that they got before they got the FMT was ciprofloxacin, metronidazone, and amoxicillin together for five days. That's impossibly huge amount of antibiotics. And they're like, and when I said that, you know, you FMT after the FMT it was restored. Oh, that could have happened anywhere. I said, have you ever met a patient with cirrhosis who comes in 50 times? They have no capacity to regenerate their microbial diversity. Everything we do to them takes something out of them. We start them on PPIs, they get the instrumented, instrumented constantly, they get hospitalized constantly, they get started on multiple doses of vitamins. So I had to do this study in germ-free mice. So we took these patients at, who got the antibiotics. So before they got the FMT, but after they got the antibiotics, we took their stools together and then we put a supernatant, which is germ-free. So we wanted to find out whether it's the microbiota or the microbial products that could do this. And then the same group of people, after they had received the FMT from the healthy donor, again were divided into germ-free and, and, and this. And what we found is there was, after they had gotten the antibiotics, the germ-free mice who received that, the entire stool from these people who got the antibiotics, their brain went on fire, they were inflamed so much. Inflammation, microglial activation, everything that fits the syndrome of hepatic encephalopathy happened after the antibiotics, which means antibiotics bad, and this got quenched by FMT. So when the post-FMT stuff was put in, it got quenched. See this? This is post-FMT in the greens, and this is pre-FMT in the reds, and this is germ-free control. And what is more relevant, you need microbiota. Because when you took the same stools, germ-free supernatant, nothing happened. Nothing happened. It did not change. It was basically like the germ-free control. The blues, the purples, and the oranges were pretty much similar to each other. So you need active microbiota. And after you receive the FMT, your microbiota is way better. And this can have positive gut-brain access influence. Are there less drastic ways of changing your microbiota? I'm just like I'm putting a, someone else's stool at a mixie and shoving it up. It is actually being Turkish or eating a Turkish diet or a Mediterranean diet. So these are healthy controls, compensated, decompensated patients from USA. These are compensated controls and you know decompensated patients from Turkey. Okay. And diversity, remember I told you, high diversity is technically supposed to be good. And clearly we found that in the American right? Highest diversity in controls, compensated lowers, decompensated even lowers. But if you're a Turkish person, it didn't make a difference. And why is that so? Are they cirrhotics less cirrhotic? Do they not know how to diagnose cirrhosis? No, that's not the case. They drink so much fermented milk product every day that this is able to surpass whatever the bad stuff the microbiota was doing, what was, was being done by the cirrhosis. So you can counteract your microbiota. That doesn't mean your cirrhosis is going to get cured. But your microbiota is going to get better and clearly that was associated with a lower risk of 90-day hospitalization and on binary logistic regression diversity was protected along with coffee and tea so good for who was drinking vegetable and cereal intake and also chocolate so people who ate more chocolate did better because and there's been studies about you know portal hypertension being reduced in people with chocolate poor chocolate eaters. so it tells you that all microbiota research is local so if we wanted to apply a Western concept to Turkey, no one, you would not believe it. You would not say that. And same things are important in cultures such as even in India, North India and some other parts of India where they eat a lot of yogurt. That's very difficult to actually put concepts that are generated here in our, in our less probiotic eating regular diet into places that eat a lot more. So you can potentially improve your microbial health by eating fermented food products, not beer. <laughs> okay. Now this is a very disappointing thing for me, and I can tell you the spoiler alert, this didn't work. This was a study in which they actually created an E. coli missile, which is a probiotic that has been, uh, it has been found, and they basically changed its internal machinery to consume ammonia. 
and produce our genes. And unfortunately, it worked spectacularly in mice. Spectacular. Mice lived a long time. But it didn't work in pigs. Didn't work at all. In fact, it increased the ammonia. Tells you that this is kind of, again to your point, Mina, one, one bug may have, because unfortunately our body has so many other pathways to figure out what to do with this excess arginine that is floating in our system. Why not convert it into ammonia? Ha -ha. Which is the whole reason why you know this study was actually done. But again tells you we should not lose hope, but we need some more studies in this field. And last but not the least is microbial interactions. Fungi can make intestine, it can make alcoholic liver disease worse. And what about cirrhosis? This is the fungal diversity, this is the bacterial diversity. Now, fungi are saprophytes. They cannot make their own food. They're dependent on bacteria. So the more different kinds of bacteria they are, the better off the fungi are. So the more diverse the microbiota, the bacteria, the more diverse the fungi. So, and in this, you see the black, which is the healthy controls. The red are the people who are outpatients, and the green are the patients, people who are inpatients. Bacterial index and fungal index go hand in. And if patients get antibiotics, including rifaximin, whether they get a rifaximin SBP prophylaxis in patients or outpatient, their microbial index, their bacterial and their fun fungal index goes down. So that's why people who get antibiotics get fungal infections because the only microbiota, that only fungus that was able to survive this was candida. That's it. The sheets of candida, they replaced this huge fungal diversity were replaced by sheets of candida once antibiotics were introduced. So it's important for us to not forget our fungal brothers also when we talk about the microbiota. And, sorry, I said last but not the least. This is last but not This is the really last, last but not the least. And this is the important thing. We are getting so caught up in the microbial, you know, thing. And if, if you've been to any of these microbial uh, conferences, it's like a cult. If you dare say anything about the microbiota controls things, you know, they, they will shout, shout you out. I went to actually MIT and I said the liver controls everything. And I was like, I almost got booed. <laughs> the microbial conference, how dare you say that? I said, okay, fine. I still believe what I believe. But because you can't make people get better with liver injury if you do not fix their liver first. You can do everything you want with the microbiota. So this is when you put people's stool into germ free mice, that's the only way you can reliably fix it and actually observe something. So if you stool from a healthy human, non drinking serotic human, non drinking serotic adeshi, Actively drinking non serotic human and actively drinking serotic human. Basically, we gave every opportunity for this mouse to develop cirrhosis, whichever way you look at it, any kind of liver infection. Not shockingly, every time you actually take this cosseted little mouse who's never seen a microbe before, any kind of bug, it gets all rigidity and it gets all systemic inflammation. So, systemic inflammation is yes, that's what you'll get with every person because they've never seen microbes before. But liver inflammation, and this is not cirrhosis, liver inflammation happened only in cirrhotic. In the non, there was the way that mouse could sense that this is healthy human microbiota and the liver inflammation never had. So there's a hint, okay. But what is very interesting is if you take an actively drinking person and put their microbiota in someone and fed that mouse alcohol, then the party really started. Then those mouse really became very So it tells you it's a key supporting player, but it's not a causative player. It's very good to support the original etiology that happens. So yes, you can fix it, but don't get so lost in fixing it that you forget to ask the patient to stop drinking or refer them to a rehab program or start them on baclofen or whatever needs to be done to actually fix their underlying disease process because you're so caught up in the microbial thing. So this is a real round ground realism right here that microbiota are well and good. You can fix them in certain conditions but we should not lose sight of why their patient is in our clinic in the first place, us being the liver clinic. So, microbial changes are an integral part of the altered gut liver axis. They are complicit but not necessarily causative of liver injury without the direct injury also. Microbial treatment has to be accompanied by treatment of the etiology. Current therapies can be improved. And what can that be? Regular dental cleaning, withdraw unnecessary PPI, carefully reevaluate the need for antibiotics, Focus on therapies that relate to bacterial function and emphasis on fermented probiotic foods. Thank you so much. Fantastic, Des. So uh, we know very well in IBD that there is another component that's critical, which is the host genetics. Yes. Do we know anything yet about the contribution of host genetics to either the composition of the microbiome or how 
how it affects the response or the nature of the microbiome. This is a very uh, important uh, question. And when there's studies have been, I mean, I'm not talking about specifically about cirrhosis itself, but studies have been done, as you know, in Israel, there, it's basically a microcosm of the entire world. So when they compared Ashkenazi versus Sephardic uh, Jewish people and compared their origins, it didn't make a difference where they came from, what their genetics was, their local socioeconomic status and the diet had an outsized role to play with the microbiome composition. That having been said, there have been studies in, you know, you have patients with hepatic encephalopathy, who, people who get encephalopathy at the first episode, the first complication of the disease. And then there's some people who go to their death completely awake to liver disease. So there's a genetic polymorphism in the glutaminase gene that I was talking about in humans that can dictate who develops encephalopathy or not. So it's a complex thing right now, but our disease is such a niche disease when we talk about even cirrhosis and encephalopathy, which is even a niche disease than cirrhosis itself, that I don't think we'll have we'll amass enough literate groups of patients to figure that out. But broad studies in non-serotic regions people who are all come and say that it has less of an um, influence than we would think. So we can still fix it by doing a lot of the dietary stuff. There's another question. Yeah. Yeah. For the decompensated cirrhotics, um, how do you disentangle the effect of uh, hospitalization uh, from that related disease? So uh, you compare them to like so it, uh, an important question is how do you define just the act of hospitalization which potentially exposes you to a lot of multi drug resistance organisms etc etc uh, so the one easy way to do it is take the sample the minute they hit the door as much as possible as quickly as possible and the reason why that is still possible in the DNA studies is because these are not culture studies once you give someone an antibiotic they culture maybe becomes to that very quickly but the DNA, because the DNA collects both dead and live bacteria, you, that that composition is kind of like the skeleton thing still happening, that those dead bacteria still hang around, so that even after one or two days after the antibiotics, it's still kind of the same. That's one way of doing it. And clearly, if you want to say, that, is there anything special about your cirrhotic patients compared to all other the patients, that depends on what question you're asking. So, that's the question. A little over time, so I think we may have to end it there. But if anyone has other questions, you can come up. Thank you so much. Thank you.